Hey guys, it's Keely. I am the organizer of the online event series, Topic and Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing. And um, today we have our friends Elena and Andrew. And I'm so excited for our first mini panel. Um, this, I just wanna give a little bit of a heads up about this project before we dive into the conversation for you all and for ourselves. This project's purpose is to show that talking about racial experiences doesn't have to be threatening for personal relationships or friendships. And um, in this project, we aren't trying to solve racism um, in one day or make extravagant claims with what we're doing. Um, we just want to encourage you to reflect and prayerfully engage with love and respect about a topic that is very sensitive for just about everyone these days. Um, and so we're going to dive into some of our racial experiences that were shared in the previous intro videos for each person, which you can see in the channel's playlist. We'll spend about 20 minutes chatting and I'll play bad cop to uh, call time and um, somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, we hope that it will encourage you. So just to get started and get our feet wet in this conversation, um, I'd love to invite you both to share um, how you identify and where your center point is for this conversation as we walk in. Yeah, so I'm happy to share first. Um, Elena, and uh, I use she, her pronouns, and I come to this conversation as a, a Christian and also as a, a mixed person, uh, someone who Grew up in Southern Ohio uh, with a Filipino mom and a white dad. And um, yeah, just trying to navigate that. Uh, and, um, and also just like, I moved away from Ohio for like 13 years after college and to come back these last three years and you know, trying to navigate what it means uh, as an adult now, you know, to wrestle with questions of identity and where I fit in um, a little bit different from when I was uh, younger, when I didn't have that kind of language and um, still trying to process those experiences. So fun to be able to talk with you both about this and see myself in your stories. So I really love like watching your videos because um, you're the kind of friends I wish I had <laughs> growing up, um, <laughs> how I enter this space. <laughs> Definitely hear you, Elena, I feel like it's crazy to think how um, growing up in the Midwest, growing up in Ohio, um, there can be those experiences where you feel so isolated and alone. And then now that I know as an adult, I'm just kind of like, where were all these people before? <laughs> but they were there. Uh, and it's great that we get to have those connections now. Um, I am uh, an Indian American man. Um, you see him from Nones. Uh, I, like I mentioned before, I grew up in Ohio, so very, very Midwestern. Um, and uh, my family is from uh, southern India, the state of Kerala, um, and I identify as a Catholic. I'm really curious, Elena, uh, just as you mentioned before about um, being mixed, being Filipina, being, being white, um, kind of how has that impacted your day-to-day -day experience just in terms of identity, in terms of being a Christian, the spaces you inhabit, um, as somebody who is not mixed, um, that is that is something that I that you know I don't really have much of a filter for. Yeah, it just definitely adds a layer <laughs> of complexity. Uh, I, I'm sure the three of us uh, have, definitely have experienced a question like, "Where are you from?" Right? And for me, I would say I was born in Tennessee. No, where are you really from? I'd be like, "I'm from Ohio." <laughs> These people. Um, then you know, telling them my mom was from the Philippines that seemed to be the right answer. Uh, so there's an element of just being, you know, not white enough, um, even in a family in which my dad is white and my sister's past is white, uh, just always feeling very otherized. And, um, and then for other people to make you feel like, you know, you're foreign or exotic and different. Um, on top of those dynamics of just like, all right, where exactly do I fit in, right? Um, and because even in my Filipino family um, back in PI, the Philippine Islands, uh, I'm not Filipino enough, you know, I don't speak the language anymore because I 
definitely um, assimilated so much to white American culture. And so not Filipino enough here, there, and then here, perhaps I'm not considered white enough, you know? And um, so it's always just something of feeling really in between worlds, um, which is, is very difficult <laughs> to, to always wrestle with. And um, uh, so I find a lot of affinity with, um, yeah, a lot of other mixed friends who, who like, who get that, who also carry the burdens of being, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color and what that means in and of itself, but then also then people like questioning, like, but are you really? <laughs> because, you know, like, how can you speak out against white supremacy if your dad is white? And it's just like, because the world doesn't see me as white. Um, and, you know, just helping to somewhat educate people on that. It just, it, it just gets exhausting, you know, to carry all of that. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely something that, and that's ongoing. And thankfully, you know, as I get older, I find more people like each of you to, to help um, work through that. But it's, it's an ongoing conversation for sure. <laughs> Elena, thank you so much for sharing, you know, from, I think that's one of the beautiful things about being friends, right, is that we can share from our hearts and speak so truthfully from our experiences. And I have a question and um, similar how we, how we talked about before we're starting the recording of this conversation, um, you can always share as much or as little as you want. And if, you, if it's like a question that's too personal for this space, but it's better for like our personal friendship outside of this recording, um, you can always indicate that too. So um, with that, I, I have like a, I have a process question right now. So, cause like, I want to, I want to connect more, you know, with what you're sharing and I want to dive in with you to where you are. And I'm something that like I hear is this overpowering narrative from outside your family life. And then it's like transposed onto your family of here's what we have to say. And we're going to push and push and push and push and push every single day that you're not white enough, that you are too Asian, that you're whatever. And your dad is white. Your mom is not white. She's a person of color. She's from the Philippines. And like, here's all the things that are different about you guys. Push, push, push. And I... The question I, that the thing that I'm wondering then as your friend is like, because it comes from this place of like, I just feel protective of my friends. And so I'm like, who are these people pushing on my friend? Like, get out of here and mind your own business. <laughs> like, what are you doing on this innocent child, like younger, you know, child Elena? So I'm, I'm wondering like, how did you feel navigating, um, like keeping unity for your family and like, what's home, you know, is yours versus like all these like pushing feet, like forces from the outside. Like, did it ever crumble and, and start to feel like those voices from the outside caused division um, or temptations to be divided? And like, it was so believable to be divided or like, um, how did you like, you know, how did you muster that strength to like, you know, um, be you <laughs> like I don't know how else to say it like because I just know like you're so strong in in community and like the values of unity and keep and, and like people coming together and, and operating from a place of love like how did you keep that strength of love when there's so much pushing um, so again you can share as much or as little as you want and mm -hmm. Um, given that it's kind of an identity question as well, although Andrew, you haven't identified as biracial, like you're Indian, if you have thoughts too, curious for both of you. Yeah, I'll share a little bit. And I definitely have a question for Andrew that very much relates uh, to all of this. And I, uh, uh, gosh, um, thank you for being protective. <laughs> uh, like I said, I, where were you both <laughs> growing up? Because I mean, and then that's not on you, but you know, I grew up in Southern Ohio where just diversity was very lacking. And I think what made it even more complicated is that um, 
feeling so alone because I didn't feel like I could go necessarily to my family about these kind of questions. Um, we didn't really discuss it. <laughs> it was just, you know, because the default was to try to fit in and assimilate. And so I, yeah, didn't, didn't discuss any of this with my parents, with um, my sisters, siblings, just didn't happen. And, and so I internalized a lot of it. And uh, one way that I really realized like, oh man, this really, um, this has really got to me. Um, you know, this was years before I had therapy and was able to process it all. But I had an interview for um, a college scholarship, you know, and was to, to enter as a multi-ethnic multi biracial student. And the recruiter like asked me, you know, like, how do I feel about multiracial relationships? And I broke down and I cried in my interview. And I kind of went off and was just like, there should be no multiracial marriages because it was just so hard. Um, I saw, you know, my parents struggle with it. I saw, uh, you know, just even my own struggle. And uh, it was just those moments that I, I, I of course, did not get that scholarship. <laughs> but uh, it was a, a time in which uh, I think it, it helped me realize, like, whoa, why am I feeling this way? And uh, realizing that like that was not fair to expect because the world is expected that of me that you know that there might be something wrong with being mixed and um, that's when I first started to really journey and wrestle with my identity really was in college because then I was exposed <laughs> to um, other Asian American uh, busy people and that really helped heal me but for a long time it was um, very harmful because I just didn't have an outlet for that. So it came out during that interview. Uh, so that, that harm is real. And um, so I guess like, that like I'm still making my way through it. Uh, I guess you can call it strength. I think part of it's just experience and finding your community and being grounded um, for me and being grounded in my faith and knowing that I'm loved and cherished and that God sees me in my whole self, my fullness, uh, with all my melanin. And that has also been healing. <laughs> uh, when I you know, found Jesus later in life, um, my college years. So again, that all like, came together uh, to help me um, really embrace who I am and to, and to not um, you know, break down and, and, and say things like, oh, people shouldn't you know, be in interracial relationships and since then I've always been in one and so yeah it takes it takes a lot of healing a lot of growth a lot of community support and I guess that's where my really my curiosity and question for Andrew is as well um hearing your experiences in your video and you know growing up <laughs> very similar uh background and with your you know it just sounds like it was just you and your sister um were you both able to talk about this stuff together and or at least in your family and if so you know like how did that go and if it wasn't with your family like did you find other outlets well i can definitely say now and especially in light of recent racial happenings it's all we talk about um but definitely growing up no we did not discuss it um, in large part because I don't think we had, I mean, when we were younger, we definitely didn't have the self-awareness to understand what was going on, um, but we also didn't have the language. We didn't have the tools to understand. Um, those were not imparted to us by our parents or by our teachers or by society. Um, cannot really blame our parents, you know, as first-generation immigrants. They uh, did not have the unique experience that my sister and I did growing up as second-generation um, Indian Americans. I, I don't think that they had the... Uh, some of the same kind of skill sets, if you will, to process what's going on. Um, in a large part, they were just trying to survive in America, trying to build a life for themselves and for us. They were not as concerned about the nuances of feeling belonging in the community or not. To them, as people who grew up very, you know, they are Indian, they grew up in India, uh, it was very obvious to them that they, they were Indian and they just assumed, I think, that for us, it'd be the same too. Um, and while, um, not being mixed, I definitely identify with a lot of those same tensions that you mentioned as a second generation. 
Asian American of the idea of being like too Asian in some circles, not Asian enough in other circles. Um, and that was definitely a tension I think my sister and I both felt growing up, but it manifested in these other ways. Like when we were in very Indian settings and we didn't feel Indian enough, we felt shame. So we rejected the Indian side. We didn't want to be Indian because we didn't feel that we connected to it. Um, I should also mention that I think when discussing race and racism, it's kind of helpful. For, I know for myself to think of it as like a three level um, thing. So you have like the individual level, you have like the communal relational level, and then you have the systemic societal level. Um, so like, what I just mentioned about rejecting the Indian identity when we were little. Um, I know we were notorious among our cousins for specifically um, like always complaining about eating Indian food, uh, which is hilarious I'm sure to many of my friends now because they know that's like all I eat basically. Um, and I love to cook Indian food too. But growing up, I, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it. Um, and I think looking back, I can kind of see multiple reasons for why that was. Um, the individual level, maybe just as a child, it was a little bit too spicy for me, right? The spice tolerance builds with time. So that was like the minor reason. Um, the societal reason was because I was fed a constant stream of commercials about McDonald's and Kraft Mac and Cheese. And when Indian food was ever represented in media or kind of popular culture, it was seen as weird and different and gross. Um, so I began to think those things about the food that I was eating at home. Um, and then I think kind of interpersonally, I know this is an experience I think many Asian Americans have, uh, or just a lot of children of immigrants, kind of like bringing your lunch to school and being made fun of for it. So even if it's not like a societal message, there are those interpersonal encounters that you have that begin to um, make you feel different about yourself, make you feel isolated, um, kind of make you aware of how your race plays a role in your life. Um, so I think as time went on growing up, I know for myself, like, I didn't have conversations with people in community about this kind of way that race impacted my life. Because once again, growing up in Ohio in the 90s, wasn't really a huge uh, population of people to, to talk to about it. Um, in part because I also went to a Christian school. Um, my sister and I were pretty much the only Indians in our school. Uh, so while we definitely were able to share experiences, um, I think we just didn't have the self-awareness really for the most part to understand what was going on. But looking back, I can see that I identified a lot with in, in terms of like my favorite TV shows, in terms of my favorite books. I always identified with the characters who were like weird and outcasts. Um, and in large part, this might've been just because I wasn't very popular in grade school growing up. I was a nerd. Uh, but looking back, and I can kind of also see that to me, it was a coded way for me to be like, I look around my school, I look around my community and I feel like an outcast because I don't look the way that attractive people are supposed to look. I don't look um, like the way successful, popular people are supposed to look. Um, what I see on TV, what I see in my community. Therefore, I relate to this character. By the time I got to high school, I became more aware of Indian American film, literature, which, you know, was really just kind of growing, I would say in the 80s and 90s and 2000s really, is when it began to kind of take off when Indian Americans have kind of a larger cultural moment, if you will. Um, so once I began to encounter those, I, I know a really formative book for me was The Namesake by Jhumpa Lahiri, in which it chronicles the life of a um, Indian family immigrating here from the mom's experience immigrating to the son's experience of growing up in America. And reading this book, I remember just being so excited and just kind of uh, like flabbergasted at like, whoa, other people go through this? Like what? Um, <laughs> which is funny, but it's like I had my older sister to watch and see what she was going through. Um, but I think once I saw myself represented in that way and was able to name, oh, this is because I'm Indian that I feel like this. This is because I'm a racial minority in this country that I feel like this. Um, it began to give me the tools to understand uh, kind of who I am, to accept who I was, to see myself as good for the first time, um, and to kind of begin to build ties of solidarity and also know how to respond to racism when it appeared in my life. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm just like, there's so many points that I'm like, things that you're sharing that I'm resonating with, that I'm feeling for and something I'm curious to hear more about Andrew and Elena is that 
turning point. And maybe there's like a series of turning points when you start to realize that you're good, that you're okay just as you are, that you're that you're perfect, that like there's nothing to be fixed, there's no there's no deficit. Um, how like how did that start to emerge and become more of like a solid thing for you um, as you as you developed your racial identity and your ethnic and organized your ethnic experiences? And again, you can share as much or as little as you want. I don't know if I'm, you know, so. <laughs> well, I, th I think, as I mentioned, and it sounds like Elena, for you as well, you know, college was a very formative time in regards to that, as it was for me. For me, it really started in high school, I would say, though. Um, like I mentioned before, encountering other Indian American narratives, whether through relationships with friends or like societal, like new media that I was able to consume. Um, for the first time in my life, I finally was you know, proud to accept that I was Indian. Um, probably went like the other direction, like a little bit too ethnocentric, if you will. <laughs> I think I've scaled that back since then. It's like, okay, there are some deficits to the Indian culture, Indian experience. You know, we, we have our problems, we need to address them. Not everything is good um, all the time. But at the same time, for me, it was this deep sense of kind of finally accepting myself. Um, with that, however, uh, I know for the purposes of kind of like this call, this, this space, uh, in, in terms of us being Christians, it was a really challenging time for me to reconcile uh, my faith with this newfound acceptance of who I was as an Indian person. Um, when I look at the history of Christianity in India and the experience of South Asians across the world with the Christian faith, a lot of it is not marked by goodness and love. <laughs> um, it is marked by um, humiliation, by degradation, um, by colonialism. And it was really hard for me now that I was in this place where I was able to finally accept, okay, I deeply know in my heart that my culture, that my skin color, that what I have, what I was born with is good. Um, how do I reconcile this with this very white religion that I seem to be participating in? Um, so for me, I think that was kind of the turning point in terms of kind of making sense of those things. Um, and since then, obviously I'm still a Christian, so I've come to figure out some answers to that. But before going into all that, I'm really curious, Elena, kind of what your thoughts about that turning point for you and what, what, what that looked like for you. Oh, mm, Yeah. I mean, yeah, definitely a series of turning points uh, in college, conversions, if you will. Uh, you know, it was a time again where I was exposed to a more uh, diversity of thoughts, of uh, representation, and that was really powerful for me. I mean, I recall just like going to a, the Midwest Asian American Student Union Conference, MASU. Yeah. <laughs> when I was like a freshman and it hit me like it was the first time that I was in a space where it was predominantly Asian and uh, you know just black hair everywhere and <laughs> hair and it was just I mean I was so deeply moved by that and to recognize like how much I needed and yearned for that in my life because that just not what I was surrounded by and so uh turning points definitely have been you know being exposed uh to people who who understand that journey um probably because they look <laughs> like me but also because uh, we have very similar experiences especially um uh, experiences of um being second generation immigrants is a whole nother layer on top of being you know a person of color um so you know, that was a big part of it on top of, yeah, also, um, you know, that's, I mean, I started going to church when I was a senior in high school and then really got into it during college. And uh, that also gave me, um, you know, a whole big sense of God's love and uh, love for others. And I, I really loved, um, you know, all the scriptures about, you know, God um, being for every tongue, tribe, and nation, and 
the problem was I also took that to mean like, oh, I should be like a missionary and <laughs> share that love. Um, it took me a, a good long time to realize also like the colonial ethic of missionary uh, enterprise within Christianity and how complicit, um, you know, spreading the gospel has been to also just like subverting people's cultures and identities. Um, and so just trying to hold all of that in tension because, yeah, because it was so new to me at the time, you know, like I just, I wanted to absorb it all and be a part of it all. And I didn't learn how to critically um, really assess that until like after <laughs> college. So again, another turning point of just reconciling all these things uh, within myself. Like, okay, to be fully me, be fully brown, to follow dark-skinned uh, Jewish savior who, you know, who also was escaping, you know, oppression as a a wee babe, um, you know, with an unwed mother, like those, those dynamics and how I read scripture uh, didn't come into play until much later in my life, you know, because it was all very simplistic, like Jesus loves you. And, and what I was fed was a white Jesus. <laughs> and it took me a long time to figure out like, oh, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe, no, Jesus, that's not what Jesus was about, you know, like our own individual uh, happiness and liberty, like, no, Jesus, all about um, our neighbors and love for others. And that then helped me to develop more critically about my own identity, but also how to, how to engage in, um, you know, sociopolitical conversations, but also just like, oh, what does religion have to do with race? It has a lot to do with it, you know? And um, so, yeah, just coming to terms with that, just a series of Training points after training points, and hope there are more because uh, it's been a rich journey. And uh, ah, yeah, the, which makes me just curious about both of you and your uh, experience with the church per se. Um, yeah, how how were you able to integrate any of that? Um, maybe particularly to you, Elise, as you continue in that journey, and now I've, like I believe since joined joined the Catholic Church. Um, yeah, how does uh, issues of race play out, um, not just necessarily in those spaces, but in your discernment and in your own personal uh, spiritual walk and discipleship? Thank you for that question and also for sharing, my friend. I, um, you know, since I guess like one little, little, little tidbit going back to the beginning intro is since I'm keeping time, I want to give Andrew the platform. So, um, Andrew, I'll, I'll give you the space and then I'll time myself so that, you know, yeah, I don't want to cut you off. So you can go first. Sure. I appreciate that. Um, thank you. So I mean, yeah, definitely resonate with so much like for myself in college, I entered college basically being done with Christianity, writing it off as the white man's religion. Um, there is that phrase at the, um, boarding schools that were created by Christian missionaries to, assimilate indigenous Americans into white American culture, they had that phrase, kill the Indian, save the man, as if there was something so subhuman about their indigeneity, their culture, that was, it was required to re remove it before they could save the person behind it. And I felt that when I looked at the legacy of kind of the missionary uh, colonial projects, um, that's kind of the message that was spread. Um, through, I, I joined an Asian American campus ministry in college, and I think that was for the first time where I began to see some of those same things that you were talking about, the idea of Christ being for every nation, tribe, and tongue, that in fact, for me as an Indian, um, my highest identity of being able to live into that Indian identity comes from me following Christ, actually, um, and that gives life to my ethnic identity. Uh, that was kind of a revelation for me, and, and began to make me finally be able to see the confluence of these identities as Christian and Indian, that they can actually live in harmony and are meant to, um, despite the racial failings of the world. Um, particularly, I think, in terms of the Catholic Church, it's actually really fitting that I chose to wear this shirt today, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Um, if, for those of you who don't know her, her story, listeners out there, if you just read the Wikipedia article, it's honestly probably good enough. 
Um, but uh, it will give you a lot of resources to look up other stuff as well. Um, I had a mentor of mine who is a Catholic um, tell me uh, the story of Guadalupe uh, when I was a senior in, in college. And at that point, I remember, um, you know, being raised a Protestant, I had a lot of suspicions around Catholics and their devotion to Mary. I was all, you know, a little bit like, okay, like she's great and all, but like, you know, why are y'all so obsessed with her? You know, it's kind of the, kind of a very natural thing. I think that Protestants are raised with is a suspicion of Mary. Um, and I know for myself going into that story, I felt that same way. After the story, I was like all aboard the Mary train, choo-choo, let's go. Um, definitely the story of the Virgin Guadalupe appearing to a indigenous Catholic, Juan Diego, um, and appearing as a indigenous woman herself, speaking the indigenous language, using the indigenous religious terms to refer to herself and Jesus. She was welcoming these brown-skinned indigenous folk into the church, very much despite the failings of the Spanish um, in their racism and in their, in their conquest. Um, it doesn't solve, I'll, I'll recognize that, it doesn't solve the issue of racism within the church, but I know for myself, through that story as kind of a proxy, it gave me the ability to look at the Catholic church and, and Christianity more, more generally as this is, my, this is my home. Like the Lord has welcomed me here. As you said, Elena, he was a brown skin, a Palestinian Jew who was the subject of a European colonial empire himself um, under the Romans. Uh, so there's a lot of ways in just identity that I, I can relate to my savior. Um, but throughout history, I think the Catholic church has shown like through the apparition of Our Lady Guadalupe, through teaching, um, through the witness of other saints, um, that very much we who are on the margins and we who are oppressed are, have a home in this church and stand as witness to what Christ taught. Um, now the work that is ahead of us is to help all of us understand that, um, which is kind of where I find myself right now in the Catholic church and what I'm doing and part of why I'm here doing this project, um, because I hope to begin these kind of conversations with those who are in the center, who are in positions of power to help understand, and even for myself in the places where I have power, um, to be able to help understand the voices of the margins, because I think that is oftentimes where the Holy Spirit and where the gospel is really at work. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, so Elena, that's a rich question. I have a million ways to answer it. There's so many pieces that are part of my, joy, my journey, given that it was a 12 year search. Um, I think the one piece that I would like to share is that one of the th one of the things that really demanded my attention um, in terms of my decision making is you know we've, we've been talking a little bit today about colonialism and how evangelism um, while pure in intention was tainted with its own culture of the people delivering the message and um, supremacy ideas that were part of it. So, um, and, I, and I can understand how it can get blended of like the gospel is supreme, but also we're the ones delivering it. So maybe some part of us is also supreme um, and it can get confused um, and lost along the way. But anyways, aside from that, um, or in the midst of that rather, I learned that for the peninsula of Korea, the Korean people, um, the Koreans are possibly the only group that were self-evangelized, meaning to say that someone outside didn't come to Korea with the gospel message. The elites who could read and write, they, um, they went to China because at the time China was considered the New York or London or like Milan, like the center, epicenter of activity. So the elites went to China to find what's going on in the world, what's the new philosophy we need to learn and keep up. And they met a Catholic priest or a pastor and um, received the gospel and totally believed it. It wasn't just like, oh, the, the new world understands and like the, the, the front, forefront of the world believes this, but rather they met and then they were moved by it. And they communed with that pasture. And 
And then they brought that gospel back to Korea and spread it among the other elites and the other like people across up and down of Korea. And it shook Korea's monarchical system of the king and other elites that didn't go with them on that trip were like, they're threatening our society. We need to make laws against this. And the, Kore the first Korean believers were heavily persecuted. Um, there was a mass, massive amount of Catholic Koreans who were um, executed, given there, there was a massacre. And then they went into hiding, similar to much of early Christian history of persecution, Christians going into hiding. And later on, um, the Protestant missionaries did come, Methodist ones from Ohio, and um, Presbyterian ones from, I think, Ohio as well, but I'm not entirely sure and went and evangelized um, South Korea during the Japanese, um, I forget what it's called all of a sudden, but anyway, when the Japanese were basically doing imperialism in Korea and trying to get rid of Korean identity by outlawing their use of language, burning their books, um, taking off women as uh, sex slaves and, and so on and so on. So anyhow, um, the that that was part of how I came to see um, a more pure relationship for myself with the church. It's not the only piece, but I, I think that's I think that history was significant for me. Um, so I'm sorry to cut this short. Um, I love talking with you guys. We could talk for a very long time. It's always so fun, um, and I love introducing my my special and precious friends to each other. So that was another special aspect to this conversation. I hope it was fun for you guys and encouraging for the viewers to um, watch. I hope it gives um, the viewers as well as us additional strength to know that our voice, your voice matters, especially in conversations with friends, that your experience is valid, that you matter, and we all need to come together to make a better world. It takes all of us, even those who feel like they're least. Um, so, Stay tuned for more conversations and we wish you God bless. Thank you.